So good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this session. My name is Louise Ryan. I'm Senior Professor of Sociology here at London Metropolitan University, and I am Director of the Global Diversities and Inequalities Research Centre. Uh, this session is being recorded. Uh, it's being recorded now, isn't it, Anna? Yes, it is. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Um, and our colleague Anna Kamek is here from the research office and she's been uh, very helpful. So a big thank you to Anna. So at the Global Diversities and Inequalities Research Centre, as I said, I'm the director. My colleague, Dr. Maria Lopez, is the deputy director. And we organise uh, regular seminars, online seminars, but also in-person events. We've got a number of very exciting events coming up over the next few months. So please do have a look in the chat box where Anna is posting information about our forthcoming events and also a link to the Research Centre website where you can find out more about the work that we're doing. I'm one of the speakers, so I'm going to stop <laughs> speaking now and I'm going to hand over to our colleague, uh, Dr Angie Cookie, who is also from uh, London Metropolitan University. And Angie herself has a research interest in the topic today, and she's very kindly agreed to chair this session. So I'll hand over to Angie now, and she will introduce the speakers and say a bit about how we're going to run the session today. Thank you, Angie. Thank you very much. Um, welcome, everyone. Welcome to this symposium on, on understanding Afghan migration across times and context. Um, as Professor Ryan mentioned earlier on, this symposium brings together four papers from five speakers on different aspects of uh, Afghan migration. I will start by introducing the speakers. We will then have a, a 20 minutes presentation. Um, we will allow a couple of minutes for pressing questions at the end of each presentation. Um, but then we will have more time at the end of the four presentations to have uh, a more thorough discussion. Um, I will monitor the chat. So if there are any kind of pressing questions, you know, please put them in the chat and we'll come back to them um, as soon as is possible. Um, just to remind you again that this session is recorded. Um, and that the recording will be made available at the end on the Research Centre website. The first two speakers are Dr. Maria Lopez and Professor Louise Ryan. Dr. Maria Lopez is a reader in sociology and the Deputy Director of the Global Diversities and Inequalities Centre at uh, London Metropolitan University. Her research looks at the dynamics of violence led by governments and state forces against migrant women and LGBT in Latin America and the UK. She's the author of Homosexuality and Invisibility in Revolutionary Cuba, 2015, and Gender Violence in 21st Century Latin American Women's Writing with Heart, 2015 as well as journal articles and book chapters. Professor Louise Ryan is a senior professor of sociology and director of the Global Diversities and Inequalities Research Centre at London Metropolitan University. She's the author of numerous highly cited articles in journals such as Sociology, Social Networks and Sociological Review and many books on migration, including Gendering Migration with Webter, 2008, Migrant Capital with Errol and D'Angelo, 2015, and most recently, Migration and Social Networks, Relocations, Relationships and Resources, 2023. I'll leave the floor to you, uh, Dr. Lopez and Professor Ryan, um, and um, I will kind of let you know when the 20 minutes are up. Thank you. Maria, I'm sharing the slides. Can you see them? Maria? Yes, it's on the way. I'm just disconnecting my camera. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. I disconnected my camera because my connection is poor for some reason today. So that way you won't lose me. So I'm starting um, now. Um, so 
this is this is the title of our presentation. What are you doing here? Narratives of border crossing among diverse Afghans going to the UK at different times, which is the title of our article. Um, this is this is um, a publication which is open access, and what we're going to do today, Luis and I, we are going to just introduce very briefly this article which we published just very recently in Frontiers in Sociology. You've got the link there. I'll copy that e link at the end of my presentation so you can have a look to, to this um, article. So next slide. The structure of this presentation um, is um, in the first part, um, we'll introduce research project, our research project aims and methods, conceptual framework, the one we used in our article, which is basically using the journey as a narrative device and applying a special lens in analyzing the narratives of those uh, of migrants, Afghan migrants in their, um, in their way into the UK. We will present the stories of the Afghans arriving in London via different routes and different times. And I will just conclude with some summarizing some thoughts. So this article um, that we will reflect on um, upon today is um, it all started. We started reflecting and gathering information and data while we were doing a research uh, project uh, funded by London Metropolitan University from January 2022 to July September, really. Um, and in that during that time, what we did what we interviewed many people. I'll give you details about it. But we were looking into Afghans' first-hand accounts of the immigration process the journey, how they these people we interviewed talked about the support and how the impressions about the support provided by the home office, associations and local authorities, and how they managed to survive and and continue the journey in those well to survive and you know survive those times in those hotels where they were um, where they were living and they've been living and still I think there are people living since they arrived into the UK, how they navigated the system and how they just survived the trauma of living in Kabul and just coming into a new country and, and those things. So that was a very, very interesting project because it an, allow, allowed us, uh, Louise and I, to just meet those people who were in the middle of their journey and they were trying to make sense of their experience. Um, so we conducted this research project in partnership with two Afghan associations based in London and they did a fantastic job and they were very helpful to us. We recruited and trained four peer researchers um, and we did interviewed, uh, we did 20 interviews to 30 Afghan participants. Uh, we did two follow up, follow uh, focus groups. We did four walking interviews to those participants um, and we interviewed five key informants. So we in, we've been in touch with these people for more than eight months now and we continue in touch with lots of them. Then when we finished the, the uh, project, we started thinking on publications and, and what we could do with all the information we had been gathering um, for months. So we decided to, to, to focus and to, to focus in the notion of this um, literature, of this emerging body of literature, the user journey as a narrative device. So we started reflecting on the way these people reflect their own journey and how different it was, even if they came from the very same place at a very same time. And also we tried to compare that with who had arrived to the, into the UK many years ago and whose journey has been completely different and through a different route. So we draw on our novel date, on our interviews, um, which, was public, which were of course unpublished, and we analysed how migrants tell their stories and also what they don't talk about what they say and what it will say, and how they present their agency in context of extreme risks, uh, particularly for those who arrived in the UK through regular routes, but also those who arrived through those evacuee process um, and fled um, Kabul to achieve a future, the imagined future, 
So we'll try to reflect on what they said and what they didn't and how they used the narrative as a, as a, as a mechanism. We applied a special temporal lens to advance understanding of the intersection of place and time and how Afghans traveling to the UK in recent evacuees are framed differently with implications for how border crossings are negotiated and narrated by them. And in doing so, complicate simplistic categories of deserving versus undeserving migrants, referring, uh, you know, making um, reference to those who arrive through regular rules they deserve, all the status and all the paperwork and all the, the um, indefinite um, uh, rights to, to stay in this country, genuine versus fraudulent, and evacuees versus those arriving at the same time through irregular routes. So we complicate all those categories. Thanks, uh, Maria. So I'm going to take over um, and present the next few slides. So as Maria said, in this we had a very diverse group of Afghan participants. Some had lived in the UK for a long time. Others had been um, evacuated uh, from Kabul airport in August 2021. So we had a lot of diversity amongst our participants. And we wanted to engage with the literature, particularly with some key concepts that have become um, quite popular in recent years. Especially we wanted to look at this notion of transit migration and the assumed linearity of migrant journeys. This idea, which is put forward by agencies like the Home Office here in the UK, which suggests that people have a kind of a clear plan that they set off from point A to point B, that they're kind of coming to the UK in a very linear way. Instead, we are looking more at the messiness, the complexity, the uncertainty with which people undertake their, their journeys, often over very long periods of time. And in addition to looking at movement, we also wanted to look at immobility and the fact that people may actually have very long periods of time in different places. And rather than just passing through those places, they can spend years negotiating their lives and trying to manage their existence within those places rather than just kind of passing through in a very linear way from A to B. In addition to that, we've also dealt with this concept of journey as a narrative device. Narratives are interpretive devices through which people represent themselves both to themselves and to others, as Mason has written. And in so doing, what we're trying to do is to transcend very simplistic views of linear journeys, but also to analyze how migrants tell their stories and in the process how they construct meaning, not just in, in telling that story, but also in how they present themselves in encounters with researchers and to have a very reflexive approach to how we understand that. And this is something that I've done um, in some of my earlier work there. I've written about uh, taking that reflexive approach to how migrants present themselves in research encounters. And as Maria said a moment ago, we apply a spatio-temporal lens in the article. And this is a concept that I developed with my colleague Umut Earl in an article we published in 2019. And we use the spatio-temporal lens to look across different levels of society from the macro context, so from the immigration infrastructure to the micro level, the individual agency, the individual actor, the migrant as an active agent, but also at the meso level. In other words, looking at that kind of in-between space between the macro structure and the micro structure to look at um, the role of interpersonal networks and how networks often mediate between the individual and the wider context. And also how this is framed temporally and how that changes through time, including through the life course. And applying that framework in the article, Maria and I analyze how migration is framed by specific places and time periods. We challenge the often passive and victimized depiction of migrants. We look at the role of relationality and networks in the migration journey and the presentation of the narrative in specific spatiotemporal contexts, including in the interview itself. And we look at imagination um, drawing on the work of Kokolainen and others. So I want to uh, present the first of three case studies. Um, I'll present two and then Maria will present the third. 
So the first case study is the experience of Bilal. And Bilal is somebody that we interviewed in a migrant uh, Afghan organization in North London in 2022. And his journey had been a very long one. It had taken more than 20 years. He left Afghanistan when he was very young and he spent 20 years in Iran. And he spoke a lot about the racism and discrimination that he experienced in Iran and what a difficult place Iran was for him as an Afghan and how badly he was treated by the police, uh, exploited by employers. He argued that um, Afghans are treated as a sort of um, a body of cheap labor in, in Iran and discriminated against and, and always kind of uh, fearing the police and fearing being kicked out of the country. Now, in his story, Bilal then narrated how he moved from Afghanistan, spent 20 years in Iran, got married, had children in Iran, but then decided that he didn't want his children to grow up in Iran, experiencing that kind of discrimination. And he really wanted to seek a better life for his children. So he set off irregularly with people smugglers from Iran across the border into Turkey. And he graphically described the fear the sense of intimidation, impending violence, uh, the threat that he feared from the security forces. He said the security forces were firing shots at people, but also the fear from the smugglers. He was relying on them. He was depending on them, but the smugglers couldn't be trusted. And he also perceived them as being dangerous and threatening. And he talked about how you encounter many thieves along the way. You don't know if they're from the government if they're thieves, if they're Turkish civilians, if they're the security forces, you don't know who these people are. And he really described this in a very moving and powerful way in the interview. Now, something which was very remarkable about Bilal was that he used a wheelchair. And when I was speaking to him face to face, um, in person, in this community center, it was very obvious to me that he was sitting in a wheelchair. And then he told his story, and then I felt, well, I really need to ask him, at what point did he end up in a wheelchair? Did he have an accident? Did he have an illness? So I did sensitively broach the subject and I said, um, uh, and so at what point did you have the accident or, or why are you, are you in a wheelchair? And he looked at me in a curious way and he said, I've always been in a wheelchair. I've been in a wheelchair since I was a child. And so this was a startling moment in the interview because it meant that that entire story that he had told me about crossing the border from Iran to Turkey and then from Turkey going through Greece and then getting a boat and then ending up in the jungle in Calais, that whole story had been in a wheelchair. But he had never mentioned that it was in a wheelchair. Like he had so taken it for granted that in the entire story, he had never mentioned that he was negotiating all of this difficult terrain in a wheelchair. And so when I asked him then, oh, oh, you, you were crossing over these mountains between Iran and Turkey in a wheelchair, he then told the story again, but this time very much emphasizing uh, the wheelchair. And he said that he wasn't able to negotiate the journey in the wheelchair at some parts because the terrain was too mountainous. And so they tied him onto a horse because he couldn't stabilize himself on the horse. So they tied on with ropes. So the point I'm making here is that this was a crucial part of the story, but he hadn't said that the first time round. But then when he told the story the second time round, he told that extra bit. And so it just goes to show the way in which people present their narrative um, may not always be as clear cut as we might assume. And the other thing to say about him is that he's now settled in the UK. He's got status in the UK. He's brought his wife and his two children to the UK and they have status. We also met them. And so he was really telling his story from a position where he had stability and security. The second person I'm going to mention very briefly is Malala, who was an evacuee from Kabul airport uh, in August 2021. Uh, Maria and I have met her now several times. She's somebody that we're following longitudinally to understand how she's getting on. She told a very powerful narrative about her experiences negotiating Kabul airport and having to rely on her networks, particularly her contacts with a British journalist, to really get through the horrific situation at Kabul airport in August 2021. 
The interesting difference in terms of temporality and the spatial dimension between Bilal and Malala is that Bilal's journey took 20 years and Malala's took about 24 hours. And it's the speed with which people who were evacuated from Kabul airport suddenly found themselves unprepared and ill-planned from Kabul to London, literally overnight, and having to rebuild their lives within that uh, rapid context. Uh, so as I've mentioned, we're following up with Malala. She spent a long time in a hotel and she is now um, in rented accommodation in London and really struggling with financial burden. Um, so she's got settled status, she's got indefinite leave to remain, but she's feeling financially extremely precarious, uh, trying to cope in the middle of a cost of living crisis. I'll now hand back to Maria, who's going to tell you about um, another participant, Sheer Shah. Thank you, Louise. So very quickly. Um, Maria and um, um, Louise, I just wanted to let you know that you've got four minutes left. Yes, that's thank you. That's enough. Yes, I will be very brief. So just to mention to me the Shershai story, he arrived via irregular route to, into the UK. So um, at the time the evacuation happened in in Kabul, he was he wasn't unable to join all the planes and everything. So he started paid for smugglers to for him, him to leave the, the country and he traveled through Turkey, Greece and um, then Italy and then he arrived in the UK. Um, by the jungle in Calais. So his story allowed us to reflect on this transit migration and again uh, reflect on the journey as a narrative device uh, that presented a more complicated approach to his journey because even if it took him like three months to arrive into the UK, his arrival was completely different from the others. He was not celebrated, he was hidden and actually he was about to tell us about this story when he met the and he arrived into the police, police station in the UK and he couldn't, he got very moved and emotional. So he stopped the interview because he was about to cry and he couldn't tell us what happened in that this day that night. So his arrival in the UK was completely different and it just allowed us to reflect on how migrants are constructed differently, not on the basis of their nationality or the, or the all the time they leave their countries and how they all the time they arrive in the UK, but on the basis of the route of entry in the UK. So he was um, living in a contingency hotel, he had lots of um, far less um, opportunities and commodities than the rest. He, his story also allowed us to reflect on this spatial temporal lens to contextualize meaning, how he was reflected on, about his position. Um, from that perspective of unresolved status. His status was completely a chaos and he was he was very uncertain and he didn't know what's gonna happen with him, he whether he would be deported back to the to the to Afghanistan or to any other country. And we also asked him about the role of imagination and how he perceived himself in several months or several years time and he didn't have an answer for that the interesting thing with him is that we were we lost him we we are not we he never replied to our emails again and he didn't want to be in touch with us so we don't know what happened with him or he had to come back to afghanistan or was um moved into a different country just a conclusion very briefly and of course you are very much invited to go into into the article and read it this is open access so just uh, just very briefly summarizing we tried to reflect and we reflected on about the inclusion of recent evacuees and how this allowed us to consider the experiences, the different experiences, depending on their, um, their routes of arrival into the country. This article allowed us to engage with the concept of migrant journey and use journey narratives as an interpretive tool mechanism. And we applied a special temporal lens to analyze how migrants' journey narratives are situated in particular places and through time. Shown the continuities, but also the changes in social political contexts and other infrastructures, especially the use of mobile communication technologies. And finally, this allowed us to analyze journey narratives through a multi-level spatial temporal lens. 
we sought to advance understanding of the dynamics interplay of macro social structures contexts, meso level of interpersonal networks, and micro level individual micro migrant agencies. So that's it. Thank you very much. I will connect now my camera. Just um, um, thank you very much. As I said, um, I just pasted. Um, I just pasted this, uh, the link to the article for those of you who want to have a look. To that. Thank you very much, Maria and, and Louise. Thank you very much for this very moving and, and fascinating account of, of people's narratives. I guess what kind of strikes me is the fact that these are people's stories, you know, their life stories, they're not just narratives. Um, and, and they highlight the complexity of migrations that is not, as you highlighted, a journey from A to B, but it's a journey that takes people to very different places, both geographically, but also emotionally. Are there any pressing questions before we move on to the next speaker? Okay, thank you very much. I guess we'll come back to this at the end when we can have a, a thorough conversation about some of the issues that you've highlighted. Um, so the next speaker is Hamid Hakimi, who is an Associate Fellow at Chatham House in London and a Senior Fellow at the Atlantic Council in Washington, D.C. As a member of Magdalene College at the University of Cambridge, he's in the interdisciplinary doctorate at the Department of Sociology, analyzes the bottom-up and subjective conceptualization of security with a focus of migrants' lived experiences in Europe. Thank you very much, Hamid. Thank you very much. Uh, you can hear me, right? Yes, we can. Perfect. Um, it's my pleasure to be here. I hope um, the, the presentation I'm going to uh, share with you um, is, is going to provide a kind of a stepping stone into my ongoing research in this area. So unlike uh, Maria's and Louise's uh, published work, this work is not published yet. I'm trying to work through it further. But um, the interest in this topic was sparked uh, in light of the evacuations from Afghanistan as the Taliban took power in August 2021 uh, for various reasons, including through my academic and think tank work. I've been involved in consultations and research, qualitative, qualitative interviews with many, many uh, of the Afghans who were either evacuated or who arrived in, the, in, in Europe uh, after 2021. And increasingly, I see that the, there is a particular kind of uh, tension that is emerging within the diaspora communities of Afghans uh, in Europe, but also uh, United States, Canada, and Australia, though those are not the focus of what I'm trying to cover. So in this presentation, I'd like to introduce some entry points, which I see as need for further study, and I hope uh, to be able to work on this further. But, but this is here more for reflection than any kind of conclusive uh, research findings just yet. So to give you a glance, um, there is no uh, established way of looking at this, but for, for, for my research, I consider since 1979 that we are in the fifth wave of the Afghan outward migrations uh, from Afghanistan. And they're all significant uh, in their own ways. Uh, in the first wave, we, we saw the concept of hijrat or hijra. Uh, the Arabic version is hijra. The Afghans uh, use it with a T at the end. Um, the, or the concept of immigration, leaving your land for religious, uh, as a religious and spiritual duty. So a lot of the Afghans who lived uh, uh, in that period and left their country as the Soviet invasion happened in 1979, um, they termed their journey outward as hijra and and therefore the word mahajirin uh, was also introduced and applied to the afghans who were in the neighboring countries and they're known as such to this day um, at, the, at its peak in 1980s there were about six million afghans in the two neighboring countries of pakistan 
and Iran with the uh, with some numbers in other countries such as the United States and, and some European Western European countries as well. Uh, and at this point, Afghanistan uh, officially hasn't had a census for decades, but the estimates at that point were in 1980s that Afghanistan was somewhere between 15 to 17 million uh, people. Uh, the, the, the population was 15 to 17 million people, so six million is a astounding number from that perspective. Um, for, for the purpose of my research, I consider the 1992 uh, return of the Mujahideen groups who fought the, uh, the Soviet Union and then returned victorious to Afghanistan to capture the whole of the country, but then began fighting each other and hence the civil war broke out. Uh, I consider that to be the second wave. Uh, in a lot of the research um, uh, that I've seen, uh, there is a kind of revisionism that's happening. So the second wave should not be the arrival of the Taliban. Uh, Taliban were actually kind of a phenomenon of the civil war. They didn't start the civil war. It was begun by the Mujahideen groups. And in this uh, second wave, um, the, the kind of the phenomenon of IDPs started to emerge as a more kind of prominent and noted feature of Afghan force, the Afghans forced displacement. Uh, there were certainly IDPs in the past. There were uh, the nomadic populations as well. And the conflict uh, up until 1992 had taken its toll on society. But in the kind of language of migration studies, I would say that 1992 uh, marked that period where IDPs became more visible. And then you have the third wave uh, of the 1996 Taliban takeover of Kabul. Kabul. Uh, and then eventually controlling up to sort of 90 or so percent of the country with the exception of few provinces in the northern areas. And um, in, in that period, we in the West, in Europe, we started to hear more about the Afghan stories, why they left their country and a kind of uh, a, a sort of, you know, a much bigger awareness of the Taliban emerged in Europe because of the human rights abuses and, and all of that. And then we have the fourth wave, which was the US-led intervention in 2001, October, uh, after the 9-11 attacks in September 20, 2001 in, in America. Um, this uh, initially led to return of, of large numbers of Afghans from the neighboring countries who felt that the country was coming to a new phase, that there was a new dawn. Um, but unfortunately, it also led to a lot of violence uh, as the Mujahideen groups come, came back uh, with the support of the United States-led uh, coalition and other tensions uh, emerged which were brewing for a while, uh, such as, for example, attacks against communities or areas that were considered uh, pro-Taliban. Um, for example, the bombing in the south of the country led to a lot of uh, IDP. So there was a fourth wave and we are currently in the fifth wave, which was uh, uh, sort of, you know, markedly uh, highlighted through the evacuations and um, this is a new dynamic uh, where there is sort of an, a new post-2021 dynamic I would say that's emerging amongst uh, the, the Afghan diaspora in Europe whereas historically as, as we saw in the previous uh, uh, partly in the previous uh, presentation as well the journeys took a long time and people arrived with stories and they had to convince uh, immigration authorities to be granted asylum. But in contemporary history of Afghanistan, uh, since 1979 in particular, uh, this was the first time uh, that such a large wave of Afghans were evacuated or who were seen as uh, sort of allies, human rights defenders, uh, and all kinds of different labels were applied to them. And they were, you know, there's a sense of entitlement to protection that is quite prominent amongst this new group that have arrived in Europe uh, post-2021 August, uh, as, as opposed to the previous one. And I'll come back to this conversation a bit more. So generally, to give you a, a glance of the Afghan diaspora, the largest communities are still in Iran and Pakistan. These two countries have been hosting Afghans for now uh, over 40 years, I believe, so 1979 up to now. Um, the numbers are, I always have issues with this, including when I've confronted the uh, the, uh, immig the the various departments in, in both countries, Iran and Pakistan, when I've done research, I've confronted them about the accuracy of the numbers. Uh, so both Pakistani uh, state and the Iranian state use uh, the number of Afghans in their respective countries as a political tool. 
It's often used to extract funding from international donors, but it's also used as, um, as a political and pressure tool against both the internationals and previously against the Afghan government. For example, um, Afghan, uh, Iranian lawmakers at one point uh, in, in, in before 2021 uh, were arguing that there were so many Afghans in Iran that if they all drank a liter of water every day, uh, Iran was facing a shortage of water partly because of this hosting these numbers of refugees. Um, so the numbers are always uh, to, be, to be taken with a pinch of salt. But currently, as we speak, there is about 3 million or so Afghans in both countries. Uh, Turkey has transformed from being more of a transition uh, to a destination country. There's a large numbers of Afghans now living in Turkey, some actually the ones who were wealthy, uh, who were able to accumulate wealth in the last 20 years, they were able to access the investment route to resettlement in Turkey. So uh, there's some of them have already attained Turkish citizenship. Others are on the, sort of on route to, to attaining that. But Turkey has become also a hub for uh, Afghans uh, who have left their country. In the Western European sense, uh, Germany has the largest Afghan diaspora. Um, as it's sort of, you know, in, in September 2021, I found some stats uh, that, uh, you know, alluded to 200 50,000 Afghans being in, in, in Germany. Um, but, you know, these numbers can all be, as I said, taken with a pinch of salt. Afghans have very diverse pathways to migration in, in Europe, uh, and different countries account for them in different ways. For example, in the UK, unless you are uh, Afghanistan born, um, it's difficult to ascertain the number of Afghans because the way we count, uh, to my understanding, uh, those who are in the UK. And, um, you know, it's, it's usually with, with where they were born. And a lot of the Afghans were born in Pakistan and Iran, others uh, to Afghan parents and in, in, in on the way or in, in the UK, for example, would not be in that number, total number of Afghans. But overall, I would, I've looked at different um, stats and I've done a few calculations, which I'm not going to bore you with here. But, but my estimates are that there are about 750,000 to uh, uh, under a million Afghans. In the UK, and this number would not be a significant overestimation if we consider that. Uh, also, because um, since 2000, August 2021, there have been uh, tens of thousands of uh, Afghans who were evacuated and brought into the UK, and others who have sub subsequently resettled. Um, historically, the study of Afghan diaspora in, in, in Europe have taken, uh, again, this is my research, so I don't necessarily. Uh, expect you to uh, not challenge it, uh, but but largely what what, what I've seen um, in the last uh, sort of years um, through my own studies that the, the strand of research on Afghan diaspora, uh, you know, has largely focused on three specific areas. There was a large body of initial study research and engagement with Afghan diaspora in, in Europe, with the lens of development interventions in Afghanistan and how the diaspora. Uh, in, the, in Europe can help with the Western donor money being spent uh, in Afghanistan that the efficiency of that spending can be increased. Um, I found, for example, references that as early as 1999, uh, IOM was trying to encourage Afghans, and these were educated or skill, skilled Afghans in Pakistan to return to Afghanistan and help in particular in the health and education sector when the Taliban were in power at that point. In December 2001, IOM started a new program called the Return of the Afghan of Qualified Afghans, or QAs, and this encouraged Afghans from around the world to come and work in Afghanistan and help with the developmental interventions and the money being spent. Um, we saw, for example, later in 2010 that organizations such as the Danish Refugee Council initiated the Afghan Diaspora Program specifically with the aim to see how the diaspora can be weaved into the policies of international aid system in Afghanistan. So that was, that's one large strand of research. And then there is the focus on integration in Europe. So the sort of, you know, the issues around minority studies kind of come here uh, as, as a focus. So you have, uh, for example, in the UK, this also included stuff around the CVE, the countering violent extremism or the prevent agenda funded research. Uh, things around radicalization because also we had troops in Afghanistan so there was also 
that contact me. There's a lot of obsession with the south of the country where in Helmand the British troops were uh, based. And, uh, and there was a lot of kind of, you know, focus on understanding how these uh, transnational links were maintained with Afghanistan by the Afghan diaspora uh, in, in, in Europe and in, in the UK uh, as well. Then uh, there was the issue of um, uh, socioeconomic and this is, you know, if you look at it, you can start off with sort of the first strand and the second and sort of in the latter years, there was also a lot more focus on how uh, the Afghan diaspora were contributing, uh, although this was a long, long lasting feature of, and it continues to be, uh, of the Afghan diaspora everywhere in the world. But in, in the European sense, there was also this obsession with the Hawala system, uh, a study in, for example, uh, in, in Oxford, there is uh, there are some anthropological uh, uh, studies that are out there, some anthropologists who are, you know, focused in this area, uh, to, to study how Afghan remittances were working and how they were helping uh, Afghans uh, in Afghanistan. Now, in March 2020, this is the kind of the last reliable stat I found, um, there were about $780 million uh, of uh, remittances to Afghanistan by the Afghan diaspora. This is not all from Europe. This is a combination of global diaspora, but uh, the largest, you know, I would say the large amounts of uh, Hawala system uh, remittances cannot accurately be counted because if they're not through the bank statements, th through the bank accounts, it's difficult to account for them. And at the point when uh, in 2020, this would have been just over 4% of the entire GDP of Afghanistan. Uh, but we also know that remittances can take the forms of non-cash contributions. Uh, for example, uh, things such as, you know, uh, jewelry, things such as, for example, electronic items and things like that that people would physically take with them uh, when they travel to Afghanistan from the diasporic homes. Um, then um, in the latter years of the Afghan Republic, um, before the Taliban took power, uh, President Ashraf Ghani, who himself was a diasporic Afghan from uh, initially uh, studying in, um, in Beirut and then uh, settling in the United States. He was an American Afghan. Um, he was very uh, focused in uh, encouraging investment uh, from the Afghan diaspora. Uh, and he, f he felt that there was a large number of wealthy Afghan diaspora in the West who could uh, really help the situation in Afghanistan. Uh, his government started thinking about the Afghanistan national diaspora policy in 2017, which was never ratified, but yet uh, it gave us a glimpse of what his government was trying to achieve. So investment and participation in national elections and allowing dual citizenship, all these things were touted as allowances for the diaspora. So this, we, we, this is kind of where we, we have been. But now uh, I'm going to give you a glimpse of uh, what I'm talking about, this kind of this tension among the diaspora that has never been studied properly. So this is a small glimpse. Um, so this is obviously a tweet by two recently evacuated Afghans uh, from Afghanistan. On the left hand side, Sahara Karimi used to lead, she used to lead the, um, uh, one of the kind of, you know, the Afghan film, I believe, the, one of the larger um, um, arts and um, governmental arts institutions. And then on the other hand, you have Sajad Nuristani, who's, uh, who on his account says that he worked for the president's office as an advisor. And the, the pictures of a gentleman, a Hazara uh, political leader, uh, to some he uh, would be considered a political uh, leader, to others he would be considered a warlord, a criminal. But this kind of tension uh, that exists. I mean, I'm using Google translation here, so it's not necessarily the best translation, but it, it tells you the kind of these conversations that happen amongst the diaspora. And although these two are from the same group uh, of, of the recently arriving Afghans, but this kind of tension of shutting each other down, in particular the shutting down of the established diaspora voices uh, by the newly arrived voices uh, is, is quite interesting. And I think this requires uh, uh, a new focus on research and perhaps the kind of the three strands of research that I talked about that has been defining diasporic re research on the Afghan diaspora is not necessarily sufficient. So I will give you some concluding thoughts. I'm running out of time as well. So Afghan diaspora, as we know, is not homogenous. And although this is acknowledged, often this is addressed through 
inclusion of ethnicity, gender and age and these kinds of things. But I think uh, a study of Afghan diaspora would se severely benefit, I think seriously benefit if the socioeconomic background of the participants is also considered the length of their stay in Europe, the pathways of their, uh, of their journey. And their socio-political affiliations in Afghanistan uh, can also be really interesting because you'd often now find yourself um, in, in quarters where, for example, a bunch of Afghans and diaspora would be um, um, arguing against another bunch of Afghan diaspora uh, over very basic identity issues and, and almost kind of like completely leaving their baggage of Afghanistan in Afghanistan and assuming this new role that, for example, in in the in the in the post 2001 climate, I think uh, 2021 uh, climate, I think the uh, the new wave feels that because of the manner in which they have been welcomed or they have been framed as allies, as human rights defenders, as people who were evacuated, that they were the wanted Afghans, and that these wanted Afghans uh, have um, have uh, right over. Uh, how they should define the situation in Afghanistan, what should happen in engagement with Afghanistan. So there are very loud voices out, uh, particularly on social media, but also generally in consultations with the Western governments in Europe in particular. So I, I will finish with this. One area that I think would be really interesting is to see how the concept of reactive culturalism may be applied to studying the interdiasporic dynamics. Uh, because although this has been historically applied to uh, responses to multiculturalism and assimilation. Uh, so, sociologists, for example, uh, Rainer Bobok, for example, the Austrian um, uh, sociologist, says that this is uh, applicable, for instance, to, to fundamentalist religious groups who do not, who feel outsiders in European society. I think this can also apply to this kind of interdiasporic group tensions, where one group feels that they're so different and is so um, entitled that they cannot compromise and they should not have accommodation with the situation on the country in Afghanistan. Now, this is not me saying that we, there should be a deal with the Taliban and Taliban should be normalized. But in any kind of political conversation, conversation on identity, conversation on values, conversation on, on, on integration, there is this significant amount of tension between the group that have arrived in Europe and or, or associate themselves to the to the departures of post August 2021, and those who have been here a long time. And I think we need to study this more deeply. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hamid. Thank you very much for this very very clear overview of the Afghan migration and uh, I guess the the ending th the ending thoughts of uh, the need for research that takes into consideration the interdiasporic dynamics. Are there any pressing questions? Uh, um, I can see a comment in the chat. Um, bear with me one second. Um, Louise, uh, did you want to? Yeah, yes, Louise, you, do you want to so, come through? So very briefly, yes, thanks, Angie. Just to agree with what Hamid was saying there in his last point about the evacuees who came in August 2021, that they're very diverse and they don't all share a particular view. And I think what we very much found in our research is that the people who managed to get through the airport because it was so chaotic, there was often a randomness to who got out. They were not all working for the British Army. Uh, they were a very diverse group. They have very, very varied experiences and they're continuing to have varied experiences now as they leave hotel accommodation. And there's going to be massive disparity in terms of socioeconomic background and resources. Some will do very well and some will really struggle uh, living with the cost of living crisis and trying to survive on universal credit. So I completely agree with you. We have to be careful about somehow grouping the evacuees as if they're somehow one very clear, cohesive group. There's certainly not that. Thank you very much, Louise. Um, we are now going to move on to the next presentation on navigating the portation. Alexander Refrusi is a doctoral student at the Graduate Institute Geneva since September 2021. 
He holds a master's degree in social and cultural anthropology from the University College London, acquired in 2018, with a thesis in anthropology of migration about Afghan migrations to Germany since 2015. Alexander Frusi completed his bachelor degree at the University of Oxford in 2016, reading anthropology and archaeology. The floor is yours, Alexander. Hi, thank you, um, and thank you for having me. Uh, I guess the presentation, thank you, perfect. Um, so um, first of all, I'd like to thank all the organizers and all the people whose work has made this possible, uh, this um, conference possible. Um, my name is Alexandre Frusi, and I'm currently um, at the um, Graduate Institute in Geneva and a guest re researcher at the Galatasaray University in Istanbul. Um, I'm midfield work and what I'll present to you is all very fresh, so I, I very much welcome comments on all aspects of this work. Um, so in this talk, I aim to highlight the stratified nature of migrant statuses in Turkey, even among people without legal residence permits, and how this stratification relates to laws in place in a particular political climate. Um, the talk highlights the political consciousness among Afghan refugees and um, their use of legal and political contexts as a means of visibilizing or invisibilizing themselves in the struggle for a continued presence in Turkey, to explore what these discursive and performative practices um, permit and the structural limits of these. Um, so I'll bring some historical context to um, Afghan migrations in Turkey um, and then move on to recent my, the recent context of migration to Turkey. Um, then I'll look at the legal context of, of, of migrations in Turkey and then um, move on to some ethnographic uh, insights and then finishing with some thoughts on these um, ethnographic vignettes in way of a conclusion. So, um, there we go. Um, so um, to the historical context of Afghan migrations in Turkey, in substantial numbers, the um, Afghan migrations really started in the uh, 1970s, um, I guess in, in what Hamid would call the first uh, wave of, of migration. Um, after the Soviet uh, military invaded Afghanistan. Um, though most Afghans in Turkey today have arrived since 2015, so I guess that's in the mid, somewhere in the middle of the fourth wave. Um, uh, after following the US and the NATO um, interventions in Afghanistan, the dire security situation, and then of course also the Taliban takeover in 2021 and the following economic catastrophe. Um, they now make up the second largest refugee population in Turkey. Um, and I don't think that there's any need to remind anybody who's here that the Afghan, um, uh, that Afghanistan's population is a very diverse one um, with many socio-linguistic groups. Um, and Uzbek and Turkmen Afghans are disproportionately represented in Turkey compared to the segment of the population that they represent in Afghanistan. Um, and they're my main interlocutors here in my field work um, as they stand in a very interesting legal um, and social interests in Turkey, which I aim to explore in this presentation. Um, on the more recent context of migration, migration is now uh, in Turkey is, is now a highly, highly politicized topic, um, as in many parts of the world, as we know, and particularly with the election approaching. Um, Turkey ho hosts the largest uh, population of refugees worldwide with an estimated 3.7 million refugees, according to the UNHCR, though I very much share uh, Hamid's, skeptic uh, Hamid's skepticism towards numbers um, and looking at migration through these statistics. But in any case, in the neck-to-neck -neck fight for the upcoming election, um, migration has become one of the biggest topics of contention in Turkey. Um, the main opposition party, the JHP has been, or the JHP Alliance, has been counting the number of refugees as yet another failure of 20 years of AKP rule um, and promises to deport every last one um, should they come to power uh, this Sunday. Uh, the date at which the election is uh, going to take place. Um, while under the current uh, government, mass deportations have been taking place, um, particularly since 2018, and even more since June 2022, um, date at which people have started being arrested and at their workplaces, on the streets, in their homes. Um, it's difficult to be sure about the exact numbers of, um, of, of deportees, um, though according to official numbers in 2019 alone, 200,000 Afghans were arrested, with more than one third of them being deported. Now, this is 2019. As I was saying, there's been a massive increase since uh, June 2022. 
Um, and also those are official numbers. So all of this is to be taken with a um, probably a whole handful of salt. Um, and people are generally um, put in removal centers that are dotted across the country, especially around the border area in dreadful um, conditions uh, regarding food and housing and, and sanitary conditions. And they can be kept there legally for up to a year um, and subsequently often deported by bus or by charter flight. Um, and then um, my last contextualization point is the legal side, because of course this to a large extent regiments material conditions of existence of migrants from access to healthcare all the way to the deportations themselves. Um, for Afghans in Turkey, there is very limited legal options. Of course, Turkey is a signatory of the 1951 Refugee Convention, though it has not lifted the original um, geographic restrictions of the convention, meaning that for all intents and purposes, it's only Europeans that can be considered full refugees in Turkey. Um, Non-Europeans can benefit from temporary legal protection awaiting resettlement by the UNHCR, um, a process that is very rare and very difficult in access um, to, uh, of, to access in practice, um, particularly inaccessible to Afghans uh, nowadays. Um, I'd like to draw your attention to also another legal um, body, another, another legal text, I mean, um, of importance for the Afghan population that I'm um, working with, uh, which is the Iskan Kanunu, the, the legal, the, the settlement law, sorry, it's called the settlement law in English, which regulates migration in Turkey. Um, originally, um, it dates to 1934, with amendments uh, later on, including in 2006, and it's a seminal text in terms of nation building. Um, it's a set of laws that determine who can settle where in Turkey, linking territorialized presence to ethnicity. Um, the law draws out a line between people considered of Turkish origin and culture, Turkish soyu ve kültürü, in Turkish, and who is not. Um, and the term muhacir, um, which later becomes Gutschman in another version of this law, um, meaning immigrant, appears and here and is defined as a person of Turkish origin and culture only. Um, so here we can see that the entire migration system works on what uh, the researcher Le Chen has called an ethno-confessional framework. Um, here, uh, yes, um, this becomes visible, for instance, in bureaucratic processes such as here, um, on this slide, you can see the General Directorate for Population and Citizenship Affairs explaining the procedures relating to acquiring work permits for Turkish um, foreigners of Turkish descent, um, as it's uh, defined here. So what is this Turkish descent? Well, in 1924, um, in the new Turkish uh, parliament, um, there is a debate that takes place around the definition of the term Türk, um, leading to the adoption of Article 88 of the Constitution. Um, uh, and uh, and sorry, and this uh, this describes Turk as any person possessing a citizenship of the Turkish Republic. But in practice, this territorial um, definition, the citizenship definition of, of Turk, um, is challenged by an ethnic, um, that meaning a, a linguistic, culturalist, and, and racial understanding of the term Turk. So um, Uzbek, uh, as you can see in that slide, basically. <laughs> Um, and Uzbek and Turkmen Afghans stand at a very interesting legal and, and contradictory legal place in relation to this layered and polyvalent term Türk, which at once signifi signifies the descendants from an imagined community in, in Anderson's sense of Central Asian origin, but also a citizenship and a legal status. Um, legally, my interlocutors possess no residence papers, but um, have a certain privilege over other Afghans in their ability to, at least discursively, draw a link between themselves and the concept of um, Turk. So what does this mean um, in the context of, um, of Uzbeks and Turkmen's in um, Turkey? I, I want to illustrate this with a few short ethnographic vignettes, which um, I'll read out to you. The first one um, involves a um, young man called Atikullah um, of 23 years uh, of age, and he's been in Turkey for four years speaks Turkish fluently, um, though his native language is um, Afghan, Uzbek, and, uh, and Persian, Dari. Um, and he works as a welder in Istanbul in a workshop um, a bit outside of town without a work permit. Um, we walked up a, st a steep and narrow street uh, that led to Hagia Sophia chattering all the way. Atikula seemed very cheerful um, with his precious Canon camera dangling from its colorful strap strung over his shoulder. The day was bright and sunny. As we made our way through the senior streets, I told him about my two recent encounters with the police, how they'd wanted my papers, and how it had made me think of him. 
he laughed unflustered and said, that happens sometimes. When I have to speak to them, sometimes I say I'm a student, he said. I tell them some university, like sometimes I say Yedi Tepe University, you know, the one that we that I pointed out to you when we passed it by minibus recently. He laughed, perhaps at the thought of being a student or playing the student or simply being mistaken for one. Recently, you know what happened, Atikula continued, grinning. I had just come out of work and out on the street it was crowded. I went into a shop and bought a snack and sat in front of the shop to eat it. Um, I stood up and just as I was throwing the wrapper in the dustbin, um, somebody called me. Hey, Yaki Shikla, hey, hey, handsome, show us your ID. They were sitting in a police car and I walked over. We talked for a while and I told them that I was studying. They asked me where I was from and I said, Güney Turkistan, but I didn't bring my Kimlik, my Turkish ID with me. So what did they say, I asked. Nothing, Atikula said in a triumphant voice. I was polite with them. I said, my Kimlik is at home. I didn't bring it today. If you want, we can go there together. But, I, but they said, no, it's fine. We believe you. So um, I'd like to stop one short second on this on this vignette um, and stop on the word Junaid Turkestan. Um, Junaid Turkestan is what Atikula says to the police when asked where he's from. Um, it's not currently the name of any geopolitically recognized region. Um, Turkestan is a historical name for a, re a region of Central Asia, mm -hmm. though that was never ruled in a unified manner under that name. It is, however, used in Turkish um, bureaucratic, uh, in, in Turkish bureaucracy um, occasionally. Here we can see a slide from um, the uh, with statistics from the General Directorate for Security Affairs. It's taken from Kirchis 2000 article, um, and we can see here that the number of migrants are lumped together to, are lumped together um, under Turkestan, um, meaning um, Central Asian countries, um, Uzbe Uzbekistan, uh, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, all the way to Xinjiang in China, the Uyghur provinces, province. Um, Güney Turkestan, literally meaning Southern Turkestan, was also called Turkestan Afran or Turkestan Jonubi in Persian, and was the name of Afghanistan's northernmost provinces, with Mazar-e Sharif as its capital, for a few decades um, up until the years 1890, and the name vanishes officially after that. But its use among Afghans in Turkey is not coincidental. It conjures up a very particular image of a political and ideological geography in which these people emplace themselves and draw out a link between themselves and the ethno and ethno nationalist current of thinking developed in Turkey in the 19th and 20th century, and which was key to nation building in Turkey. Um, in a way, its use discursively contributes to people demigrantizing themselves um, in the sense in which migrant is increasingly understood in public discourse in Turkey as a foreign presence within a supposedly homogenous national body. Here, they discursively emplace themselves within this uh, national discourse. Um, I have a few other examples, which maybe we can talk about in the question time, if it's of any interest, um, about how um, people also use um, linguistic tools and linguistic fluency as a means of demonstrating a certain legitimacy of, 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 of living um, in Turkey, uh, being arrested and then speaking fluent Turkish and then the police sort of complimenting them and then going back to an explanation of, oh, of course, we were one, we were once one people. Um, and I draw out these practices um, because in the absence of legal papers preventing the deportations of my interlocutors, these performative techniques are often drawn upon. Um, they are, however, not fail proof at all, nor are they considered such um, by the people using them. Um, and the privilege enjoyed by this group of Afghans over others um, who are not considered Turkic um, is, a very, is very relative. Um, drawing on these performative and discursive techniques always holds a large element of uncertainty um, and the outcome of their use is unclear, um, as is shown in this, um, as I'd like to show in this next, um, next vignette. This one involves a young man called Mohammed, who is a carpenter in a workshop in the suburbs on the Asian side of Istanbul. Um, he's 25 years old and has been uh, here for seven years, um, in Istanbul that is. I have a story to tell you, Mohammed said, as we sat down on the white panted bench at the very rear of the boat to Bakırköy, an area of Istanbul. The day that I last saw you, I walked you to the bus, remember? And then I continued towards work. I was walking with sunk eyes. I was so tired, not fully awake. And suddenly I felt two people by my side. They were policemen. One was young, the other one was older with a beard and an unpleasant face. I asked, they asked me where I was from and I said, Güney Turkistan, you know Afghanistan's old name. They asked me for my Kimlik and I said, I don't have it. But if you want, no worries, we can go home and get it. Mohammed's face was calm and smiley as the wind ruffled his bleached blonde hair, but I could feel a tension in his voice. 
One of the policemen said, there is no need to go to your house. But the other one said that there was need, um, Mohammed continued. They put me in a car and went straight to the police station instead. Um, they said, you can call a friend and tell him to bring your kimlik, your ID, that is. Um, I first wrote to my girlfriend to say goodbye. This time there would be no return. I wrote to my boss too, and he knew somebody in the police station and contacted him. We talked for a long time and then settled on a thousand dollars to free me. I gasped at the amount and asked Mohammed who would have to pay the enormous sum. My boss wanted to pay all of it, but I told him that I couldn't agree to it. So we agreed on half and half. Every month he takes a few thousand lira from my salary to make up for it. Mohammed's eyes narrowed slightly. He paused, then shaking his head said, something has changed since then. I'm no longer joyful in this place. I'm tired of this situation. It's tejorate in son. It's human commerce what they're doing. I'm sick of this. So I'd like to uh, make a few uh, remarks on this vignette in way um, of a conclusion. Um, these episodes highlight the very stratified and hierarchized uh, landscape of migrant opportunities, even among migrants with others. Um, without papers, that is, with papers, but without papers present, preventing their potential um, deportation. The anthropologist Aisha Parla speaks of entitled hope, a form of affect, a possibility of hopefulness for a positive outcome in the fight for a legal residence permit that is afforded unequally among migrants. Um, although she works with people who already have residence permit in their fight for citizenship. Um, and this is uh, where I argue that there's a danger in turning away from law and legal frameworks um, due to the absence of residence permit. Lack of legal papers, as we know, does not mean absence of legality, but very much the presence of an absence of a legal permit. Um, and thus an exclusion from legality that is very much part of the legal bordering landscape. Um, and as Anne McNevin or Victoria Greaves highlights, a part of a political structure at large in a genealogy of exclusion. Um, although the people in this ethnography have no legal residence permit in Turkey, their interactions with the police draw on existing political legal context, which they are aware of, though have no practical access to. The performative aspect of this is thus deeply linked to the legal structure itself. Indeed, the entire arena of migration and deportation with its heavy reliance on what the researcher Le Chen calls infra law or legal vacuums can be said to take place beyond the confines of legal considerations solely and enter performative and discursive registers, both on the side of migrants, but also of state practices. And there's been work on that. Um, in this case, um, in the case that I presented, the performative sides of these discursive acts base themselves on the very ambiguity surrounding the concept of Turk, um, of Turk um, with the uh, associated legitimacy it affords. The ambiguity that is of Turk as a territorial or as a racial category, or what the researcher Öztan qualifies as the gap between formal definition of citizenship and its actual fabric. This makes space for the performative and the discursive and their relationship to the infralegal. Um, my next point is that in the current climate of deportations, um, labor, um, labor relations have been challenged. Um, the Turkish economy relies heavily on the informal sectors um, and workers such as the Tikula and Mohammed. But in the upsurge of deportations, employees have been increasingly struggling to find workforce, leading to increased leverage for those who have managed to remain, often people who have managed to negotiate their way out of arrest, in examples such as the ones that I gave above. Um, employers intervene in moments of arrest, medical support, or even towards providing variously manufactured um, residence permits, um, simultaneously maintaining exploitative labor relations. Um, despite the increasing leverage in uh, labor relations, the possibility of deportation affects everyone. This relative privilege comes to a legal and material limit in the moment of deportation and dispossession that comes with it. Access to performative and discursive practices is stratified, um, practices that enable an advantageous access to material conditions and a space for negotiation with the police. One, however, which can easily be brushed aside, in which case this relative privilege evaporates and the person becomes as paperless as anybody else in the detention center. And finally, I think that I'm running out of time, but my last point is that I think that um, this case highlights um, another layer of complexity to our understanding of um, how ethnic groups, um, or what Olivier Roy has called solidarity groups, or perhaps we should just use the Persian term qaum, um, what this means um, to be of one qaum or another. Um, 
it's been, uh, though it's been argued for researchers, uh, by researchers that their meaning should not be considered as a fixed one, highlighting the importance of political, social, and historical context in the meaning making associated to ethnic groups in Afghanistan, these categories are still frequently um, used uncritically, especially by Western researchers. Um, this case, I think, highlights how, com how, how, how ethnic, um, well, yeah, how ethnic uh, affiliation um, is in one place, in one place can mean something very different to what it means in another. In this case, um, the Turkishness associated to calling oneself Uzbeki or Turkmen Afghan um, can grow of importance um, and an importance and hold an importance which it doesn't necessarily hold in Afghanistan. Um, so, yeah, I thank you for your attention and uh, look forward to uh, your comments. Thank you very much, Alexander. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this uh, kind of beautiful overview of how some uh, Afghan individuals navigate avoiding being apprehended by the police. And I, I guess what I was left with was this sense of uncertainty uh, that people have to live with and how that can impact a person's ability to, um, I guess, settle down and into into another country. Um, I'm mindful of the time, but I just wanted to double check whether there were any pressing comments. I've been monitoring the chat and I can see that people have been uh, um, commenting and maybe we can go back to it at the end of the um, the presentations. But I just wanted to see if uh, anyone had a, a pressing comment that they wanted to make at this stage. Okay, if there isn't anything, then we can move on to the last presentation. Um, we've got Dr. Kerry Uppen, who's a senior lecturer in human geography and co-director of the Sussex for Migration Research at the University of Sussex, UK. Um, Dr. Uppen has done research with the Afghan diaspora for almost two decades, including ethnographic fieldwork in India the US, the UK and Norway. She's co-editor of Beyond the Wild Tribes, Understanding Modern Afghanistan and its Diaspora. The content of the presentation was developed in partnership with colleagues at the University of Peshawar, Professor Abdul Raoub, Professor Shahida Aman and Dr. Ayub Jan. Dr. the floor is yours. Thank you, Angie. Um, Apologies, I, just, I haven't used this system before, but I assume I just click through the bottom of the slides to to go through. Awesome. Um, thank you very much to the organisers for this great event. Um, it's fantastic that we've got these different perspectives on Afghan mobility and, and diaspora in different locations. Um, thank you very much in particular to my co-authors who sadly can't be here today because of the partly because of the time difference, but also those of you following the news from Pakistan will see that there are some internet problems amongst other things that there at the moment. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge the students of the University of Peshawar um, in the Department of Political Science who are really instrumental to collecting a lot of the data um, that we're looking at in this project and in this presentation. Yeah. So, uh, first of all, I'm going to talk about, um, very briefly introduce the bigger projects that this presentation is part of, protracted displacement economies. Um, secondly, I'll focus in on what our data tells us about mutual support between people affected by protracted displacement, uh, based on our research with Afghans and Pakistan. Thirdly, I'll say something about new arrivals since 2021, uh, in particular new arrival arrivals in Haripur, one of our field sites, and then I'll conclude by trying to reflect on the necessity and limitations of mutual support. Um, so my main focus is on mutual support, although we've looked at many other aspects of life in this project. Um, so this is the, the project. We're working in five different countries, um, but obviously today I'm only talking about Afghans in, uh, in Pakistan. Uh, we have three field sites in Pakistan an urban field site in the city of Peshawar, 
uh, a more rural field site in the areas surrounding Jerush and Chitral in northern uh, Pakistan. And then, sorry, the formatting's got a bit funny on, on this screen, but our third field site is Haripur Refugee Camp, which is just northwest of the capital, Islamabad. Um, I assume you're relatively familiar with the context, but uh, to very briefly say, uh, Pakistan is home to one of the largest protracted displacement uh, populations in the world, Afghans who have been there for 40 plus years. Um, the area of Pakistan in which we've been doing the research is very intimately linked with Afghanistan. Um, so Peshawar is closer to Jalalabad in Afghanistan than it is to the capital of Pakistan and much, much closer than it is to other major cities in Pakistan like Karachi. Um, so in this area, uh, as I'm sure most of you know, uh, was divided by the Durand line right through the center of uh, an area associated with the Pashtun ethnicity. So some of the Afghans coming into this area are traveling to areas where actually they share a lot in common in terms of language and culture with the so-called host communities that they end up in, with the exception of our field site in Jerosh, uh, where the host population at Chitrali uh, speak a different language, have a different ethnicity. So in each field site, uh, we did a mix of different research methods, a household survey, covering over 3,000 households or over 26,000 individuals and 180 qualitative interviews. And the important thing to note here is that although today's symposium is about Afghans, uh, in this project, we were talking to both Afghans and Pakistanis. Um, so I'll note if the data is specific to Afghans um, when that's relevant. In terms of gender breakdown in our sample, 40% uh, of our sample are women. So just as a, a bit of a caveat, we're still midway through this. We've done the um, first survey and the first half of the interviews, and we're about to start a smaller panel survey. Just click through. So as part of this project, I think it's important to explain the approach of the project so you can see where my interest in mutual support is coming from. So firstly, our approach to this issue of displacement economies or the economies of people affected by displacement is that we're taking a whole of society approach. So using the idea of the displacement affected community as our unit of analysis. And this is in recognition of the often fuzzy distinction in relation to binaries of host and refugee populations. And that's particularly relevant in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, um, but also in, our, in the other countries we're looking at too. Secondly, we're taking a inclusive approach to economies. So we're not just including countable market orientated activities, but also the activities and transactions that are not necessarily financial. Um, for example, the care of children and the elderly, uh, mutual support and solidarity, or the activities that in turn enable people to undertake more financially orientated economic activities. So in this, we're inspired by feminist approaches to, to economics. So for example, in our Pakistan field sites, most women are not working outside the home in paid work, but through their labor, they enable male members of the household to engage in income earning, either indirectly through maintaining the households uh, or directly by making and cooking goods for male relatives to sell. So some of our participants were doing things like selling soups and uh, chips and things in the market. And it was their wives and female relatives who were preparing that for sale. So as I said, the project covers many different aspects, but today I want to focus on mutual support. And mutual aid and peer to peer support is often overlooked in research and discussion about aid to communities affected by displacement, whether refugees or host communities. The focus of research in this area tends to focus on formal institutional responses channeled through governments, through the UN, NGOs, etc. Where refugee economies or refugee economics have been analysed, they tend to focus on resources being distributed via the domains of the state, the market and civil society. But in this project, we're trying to get beyond that. And, and we argue that this kind of state market civil society approach 
only represents a partial mapping of what's really going on in people's economic and social lives. And in fact, survival in many displacement settings usually requires a combination of people's own resources and those mobilized, those that they mobilize from locally embedded so-called informal networks and relations. And I'm saying so-called informal because often there is a kind of inherent formality to some of these informal networks. For most displaced people, access to resources can be found via reciprocal arrangements uh, with reliance on relations such as kin, clan, religious and ethnic networks. And a key priority for our project is to find out more about these relations of reciprocity and mutual support. They're under-researched, little understood, but wholly relevant to the lives of displaced people and people affected by displacement. And it's in this research space that we can engage with the moral economies that underpin support in times of mass displacement. The basis of such economies requires an understanding of the reciprocities that are integral to the sustainability of life and livelihoods. So it's very hard, obviously, to capture these kind of ideas in quantitative data, uh, but we tried. Uh, so here's some findings from our household survey. And what's, what's really interesting is how much mutual support is both received and given between neighbours in our different field sites. And just as a reminder, in some of our field sites, so in Haripur refugee camp, obviously it's mostly Afghans, but in our other two field sites, there's a mix of Afghans and Pakistanis living in the same neighbourhood. So over the last five years, 22% of our survey respondents had received financial support from neighbours and 40% non-financial support, so childcare, food, helping an elderly relative, etc. And the figures are very similar, 20% uh, and 38%, for giving support too. So that indicates that there's a high degree of reciprocity uh, in giving and receiving. And unsurprisingly, given the often precarious nature of people's livelihoods, non-financial support uh, was the most common and particularly the sharing of food. One of our survey questions was, do you think your neighbors are ever in a situation where not everyone in the household has enough to eat? And the answer to that was 37%, an interesting, almost identical answer to the same question, but referring to their own household. Uh, so 38% answered yes in their household. There had been times in the last year where everyone had not had enough to eat. We followed this up with a question about, are you able to help them if your neighbor's household? And the majority answered yes, uh, particularly by sharing food, but also in other ways. Issues of mutual support were much easier and more apparent to find in the qualitative research, um, which won't come as a surprise to many of you. Um, so, for example, this quote from an Afghan man in Chitral. And as I said, this is an interesting field site because these are not Afghans living with co-ethnics. They're living, they're not, it's not Pashtuns living with fellow Pashtuns, but Pashtuns living with Chitralis. And he says, these people are poor people themselves. How would they support us? We're st still thankful because they allowed us to collect wood from the mountains they own. They had nothing to offer us. At the very beginning, they would offer us food, but when we came to the camps, uh, but they have no money and limited resources. So they could not offer much. We've taken their timber and grazed the grass and have never objected to that. We still do that. The people of Chitral have shown sympathy to us. However, they couldn't offer money. They had no money themselves. The locals are still helpful in other ways, though. They would go with us to police stations for good character references if needed. Who else will do that for us? The locals are very kind. And so this quote illustrates how despite the lack of financial resources, uh, the people in the so-called host community in Chitral uh, had available to them, they still provided support in other ways. And we see this often in displacement situations. It's the local communities who are both the first line of support but also the long-term line of support as well. One of the most significant ways in which reciprocal support was practiced in our field work is through the activities related to, and I'm sorry for my pronunciation, Gamkadi, so occasions of joy and sorrow. So these are, these are the events surrounding something like a wedding, the birth of a child, a graduation, or on the sadder end, funerals. 
And it may seem odd to refer to such occasions as a source of mutual aid or mutual support, but the frequency at which they're occurring means that they are a significant part of reciprocity, uh, particularly the sharing of food in neighbourhoods. And at, at times of Gamkadi, neighbours will provide food, sometimes money, often labour, for example, helping to prepare food, as well as emotional support. It was evident in all three of our field sites. And interestingly, when I asked Pakistanis about relations with Afghans, it was often brought up as a, a reason why relations were good. The participation in these kind of activities was seen as a defining feature of a good neighbour. So I want to turn now to the issue of new arrivals from Afghanistan since the takeover of the Taliban in 2021. And so this project is about protracted uh, communities, um, but of course uh, we did ask about more recent arrivals. And actually I was in Pakistan for the last two weeks, um, still a little bit jet lagged, and this is one of the things that we discussed. So it's very hard to get figures on how many arrivals there have been since 2021. The government of Pakistan estimates around 250,000 in the first year after August 2021. The Commissioner for Afghan Refugees, um, who I spoke to last week, said around 300 to 500,000 new arrivals. The data from UNHCR and IOM is very difficult to unpick. Um, and you know, I tried to look at the IOM's flow monitoring, um, very high numbers crossing the borders. Uh, but it's not clear who is crossing, whether they're crossing just for business purposes or to stay uh, longer term, who's crossing, whether it's Afghans or Pakistanis, etc. So I think we have to definitely take the figures uh, with a pinch of salt. But interestingly for us, the, our respondents in Peshawar, so this is uh, from a, the picture is from a focus group in Peshawar uh, just over a week ago, um, told us that the people who had arrived in that area of the city uh, since 2021 weren't really new arrivals. There were people who had lived in that area before, had gone back to Afghanistan, either because they'd been deported or they'd chosen to return. And then with the, the resurgence of the Taliban had then come back to Peshawar. I'll turn now to our other field site, Haripur, to say a bit more about the new arrivals there, because it's a slightly different situation there. So Haripur is currently the largest Afghan refugee camp in Pakistan. Um, it was established in the early 1980s and many of the people who lived there, and most of our respondents in fact, have either lived there since then or were born in the camp and have lived there since then. So this is a definitely a protracted situation. Um, but I did a focus group with women in the camp and one of my male colleagues did a focus group with men in the camp and one of the questions we asked about was new arrivals. And they estimate that about a thousand families have arrived since the summer of 2021. Um, and given the average of family size in this camp, uh, the mean family size is eight, uh, to about potentially 8,000 people or thereabouts. Mm -hmm. And they have a very different profile from most existing residents. So though some of them are former returnees, um, as is the situation in Pejawa, most of the people who uh, coming to arriving in Haripur over the last two years, uh, almost two years, are uh, from a higher educational background. Um, people who have worked with NGOs and the international community in Afghanistan. And in this focus group, um, they gave me a number of examples, including some women lawyers who had worked in Kabul, uh, had had to flee Afghanistan uh, and were now stuck in Haripur. And they also talked about how many of these new arrivals uh, were hoping to be re resettled or evacuated to Europe. Um, I mean, this is a kind of wider issue for people living in the camp anyway, uh, that people want to be resettled to Europe. But I think it was more pronounced from what people were saying for the people who had had this experience working in international organisations in Afghanistan. And I asked the women in the focus group I was doing about the issues that these new arrivals faced. And the key one was accommodation. And here again, mutual support was key. Most of them were living with family, uh, distant family members, at least temporarily until they accessed their own space. And this was a big problem because although that support was there, 
space was obviously limited uh, and it was a burden on their family members. Another issue was boredom due to lack of relevant opportunities uh, and employment based on their skills. And also these new arrivals in Haripur hadn't been granted proof of registration cards. Uh, so in other words, they weren't recognised as refugees by the Pakistani government. So they then had trouble accessing education for their children and health care for themselves. So I'm running short on time, but uh, I shall just conclude by talking a little bit more about the necessity and limitations of mutual support. So our data demonstrates, and anyone who's done work in refugee communities will recognise this as well, the significance and breadth of mutual support within displacement affected communities. I think relatively unusually in refugee studies, we've got some quantitative data, uh, as problematic as that can be, to back up this qualitative observation. And interestingly, this mutual support of, you know, benefits both Afghans and Pakistanis, although I've focused on Afghans in this presentation. Our research has also demonstrated that not surprisingly, having been there for 40 plus years, Afghans are economically and socially embedded in Pakistan, even if they don't have legal and political role, most of them don't have legal and political rights there. For example, Afghans are not allowed to own their own businesses, to own property such as houses. Um, the Afghans here in the camp in Haripur, they're allowed to build walls for their houses, but they're not allowed to have a permanent proper roof on them. So there are many ways in which the government has kind of maintained this temporary feeling, even though people have been born there and lived there for 40 years. But despite these challenges, uh, there's no doubt that Pakistan has been and, and is home to many millions of Afghans. And whilst initially their, their presence brought huge amounts of international resources in the form of aid money uh, in the 1980s, since then, um, socially embedded economic and uh, social cultural relations of reciprocity have had to fill that gap as the international support has waned and people have had to rely on their own and network resources to support themselves. So it's really important that we think about these kind of levels of mutual support but it's also equally important not to romanticize them and whilst these kind of moral economies attached to mutual support are integral to understanding a protracted displacement situation, they also throw up challenges in terms of exclusions. Uh, they can reflect existing forms of discrimination and marginalization. So for example, who's included and who's not. Uh, they can also be based on unaccountable relations that are themselves unequal and part of kind of wider dynamics of exclusion and marginalization. And that's why I think a, a better understanding of this issue of mutual support, mutual aid is needed. And that's what we hope to continue to do in this research. So I'll finish up there uh, and say thank you very much for listening. I've put the link to uh, the project website here on this slide and we'll be sharing our findings as they come out. And I'll also put a link to a short uh, commentary piece we've done about Afghans and Pakistan in the chat as well. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Kerry, and thank you for that uh, account of uh, what type of support individuals receive. I find it fascinating to have both the quantitative and the qualitative element, despite obviously all the limitation of the quantitative data. Um, and I guess, yeah, as you highlight, uh, it really kind of stresses the, the the heartwarming element of mutual support, but also some of the potential inequalities that can come as a result of that. Um, so we are at the end of uh, the presentation. Um, yes, Louise, uh, you have a question uh, for Kerry. Oh, thank you, Angie. I didn't want to jump in first, but I thought um, maybe I can ask my question while other people are getting ready. People are getting ready to ask theirs. So. Thank you very much, everybody. It's been really interesting to hear the four presentations, which I thought complemented each other very nicely, um, looking at the experience of Afghans from different countries, from Turkey, Pakistan, as well as the UK. Um, I wanted to ask Kerry, I was really interested in your methodology and in your analytical framework, Kerry. I was just surprised you didn't use social network analysis, because to me, everything you said about reciprocity, 
about those connections, about the different kinds of ties. Um, I am a social networks person. I've just written a book about social networks and migration. So I see social networks everywhere. But I, I really felt that, that your presentation really spoke to the usefulness of using a social network analysis framework. But you didn't mention uh, networks at all in your whole presentation, which I found very curious. So I'm wondering, is there a reason why you're not using a social network framework? Uh, yeah, that's, I mean, that's a really good question. And I've also used, um, to some extent, although I'm not a sociologist, uh, social network analysis in, in previous research. Um, it's certainly something that we will be including in our analysis, but in our data collection, we've been focusing more on the kind of um, practicalities of who's doing what and where, and then we may apply some element of social network analysis to that, um, but it hasn't been, we've tried to um, build on previous work on refugee economies in this project. Um, so we've tried to build on that work and add to it. Um, but yes, you're, you're totally right. Social networks hugely, hugely relevant to what's going on here. And, and this mutual support wouldn't exist without social networks. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we are at the end of our presentations. I think, uh, Louise, you really highlighted how they complemented each other. You know, we went through a journey that's spanned from kind of stories behind migration, the need to take into consideration the interdiasporic differences, Some very interesting comments in the chat. Um, around the need to take into consideration differences across geographical settings, as well as differences in ideology and, and differences in digital skills, which I thought was kind of very, very interesting as well, and, and maybe something that we don't often take into consideration. Um, and I guess, you know, the, some of the presentation also highlighted the creative ways in which individuals try to protect their very they're already unsettled position. Um, and, and then some of the <clears throat> stories in which um, individuals try to support each other. So I just wanted to open up the, the conversation. We have about 10, 15 minutes uh, for discussion. Um, so if anyone from the chat would like to expand on their comments, or if there are any new comments, you know, please feel free to um, come through. Angie, maybe I can have a go. Um, sure, I was I was interested in what Alexander was saying about this uh, notion of calm, this concept of uh, solidarity. And I'm also I mean, I mean, Kerry's here, she's uh, much more experienced than I am, but I'm also aware that in the initial periods of Afghan migration in, in Pakistan, particularly when what is today Khyber Pakhtunkhwa KP, and it used to be the Northwestern Frontier Province, NWFP, and that's where the Pashtuns reside in Pakistan, that this concept sort of was there as well that in the in the when the jihad period was happening against the Soviet Union in Afghanistan, a lot of Afghans um, were welcomed and in fact for many years no Afghan needed to carry any documents uh, because they were considered to be same people the same calm same sort of like solidarity and then it seems like as the as the time goes on and there's utility for electoral politics in particular that these kinds of things then shift. And that authorities, especially police and others, and also social attitudes, often interact with um, kind of you know uh, electoral political platforming of these issues. So I wonder to what extent Alexander thinks, or if he's got an opinion on, um, you know, whether the current debate in Turkey on basically becoming super anti-migrant in many cases, especially in Istanbul, has implication in how the society, the police and others uh, view the Afghans. Uh, because for instance, as, you, as I'm sure you know, the, the, the Syrians were granted uh, temporary status, something that the Afghans weren't granted. But there are a lot of Afghans who have come on investment visas and other kind of routes to access residence in, in, 
in Turkey, particularly in Istanbul. So it's this kind of concept of a bit of antagonism and not really trusting your calm. Does it extend to all of the Afghans or do they see all Afghans as kind of one or do they differentiate in the perception between one who's Uzbek and Turkmen and, and the others? Yeah, thank you for the thank you for the question, and it permits me to expand. Yeah, super super interesting point. Um, <clears throat> I think that for, for the one part, um, the example that I've presented, uh, I think speaks quite interestingly to the construction of calm itself, to how calm uh, is often considered in in academic circles, but also among certain people who identify to a certain calm as being a sort of atemporal, static thing. And here we have an example of sort of performing certain aspects associated to the calm, at least in Turkey, being, uh, let's take, for instance, the Afghan Uzbeks, um, speaking of Turkishness and speaking of soydash, is this, this idea of brotherhood, of, of, of lineage, brotherhood of sort of almost racial um, brotherhood. Soy means more like descendants, but um, suddenly becomes a very, st very strong importance in, an, in a very practical way, so as not to get arrested. And so I've, in my fieldwork, thought, struggled a few times thinking, okay, so in these moments, do, do people actually believe in this Turkishness, in this, in this pan-Turkishness themselves? Um, or, or is this just a performative theory? And I've sort of decided to put this question aside um, because I don't think it's relevant whether people believe it or not. It is a reality that functions. Presenting yourself, here you are, by being Uzbek, Afghan, you are considered as a soydash, as a brother of, of descent. So even if even if in Afghanistan they might not have believed that or, or found that of any point of, of relevance, in Turkey it becomes a reality. And so I think there you can really see how it shapes the the the, the calm itself, a self-perception of calm, at least here in Turkey among Afghan Uzbeks. And then your question was more the reverse of the view of the police um, or or the, the sort of state or, or or general social view of Afghans. I think that again these examples, I mean. I, I, I'm only six months into my fieldwork. There's still a lot to be uh, discovered, but um, or to be kindly disclosed by the people that I work with, um, if they want to. But um, I think that not using the term Afghan is very tells a lot. I think it tells a lot in terms of how Afghans are being viewed in Turkey. I think that um, by avoiding this term um, and using the term Güney Turkistan, as my interlocutors do very frequently. I think it shows to what extent Afghan does not enter into the category of um, a legitimate migrant. And legitimacy can be valid grounds upon which to flee, whatever valid may mean, um, but also very much do they fit here? Are they people who are supposed to be here? Um, and I think Uzbeks from Uzbekistan, Uzbekistanis, as Afghans of, often call them, Uzbekistanis have had to negotiate this position. It's not unique to Afghan people considered of Turkish origin and culture, but people have been having to negotiate that for a long time. But sorry, I'm going to wrap up. The, the bottom line is, I think, um, I think very often no. I think very often uh, there is a there's been a huge uh, growth of delegitimization of Afghan presences in Turkey. Even though, as you highlighted very correctly in your presentation yourself, there is a whole genealogy of Afghan presences in Turkey since the 1970s. Thank you very much, Alexander and Hamid. Any other comments? I'm mindful that I remind uh, the participants that the uh, meeting is being recorded, so apologies for that. Just to let you know that the, the recording will be available on the research website, the research centre website after the meeting. Um, yes, Kerry. Uh, Thanks. Yeah, I'd just like to um, follow up on on that discussion and also to um, Palwasha Ahmadzai in the chat, um, who says I don't see this aspect of calm as solidarity for a refugee. Um, and just to add some, of, I suppose, a nuance to the slightly romanticised version um, of solidarity there that in in Peshawar, the people I was speaking to um, who were of uh, Pakistani nationality, uh, they recognised the Afghans there as fellow Pashtuns, uh, but there was very much a hierarchy, even though the the Afghans Pashtunness uh, enabled the kind of mobilisation of resources and support. 
um, there was still this idea that uh, there was a hierarchy between Afghan and Pakistani Pashtuns. So I did a focus group with uh, Pakistani men who were talking about, um, and this is I'm quoting what they're saying and absolutely not uh, condoning what they're saying, but they were basically saying that uh, the Afghans had become more civilized during their time in Pakistan. So they definitely saw, even though they were fellow Pashtuns, saw these Afghans as from a lower class, laborers, they were working in trades that Pakistanis weren't willing to do. Um, so there's definitely a, a class dynamic there as well. Um, even though there was a sense of solidarity in relation to the jihad in Afghanistan and various other kind of aspects. So just to add some nuance there. Thank you very much, Kerry. Um, Louise, do you mind if I come back to you in a minute? I think there is an important comment in the chat from Farzana we would like to highlight. Um, Farzana, would you like me to read it out or would you like to um, kind of mention it yourself? I think you, you raised something incredibly important. Uh, um. uh, thank you, Angie. Uh, it's your choice. Either you would like to read or you would like me to talk about that. I think if you could read, that would be better. Sure, I'll, I'll do that. So Farzana says, they're all, I appreciate the highlighting of the Afghanistan's migrants in your research. I, as a victim of the war until today, deprived of my basic rights, either in my country, Afghanistan, or as a homeless outside Afghanistan. I would like to know what is your suggestion to the international community that left all Afghanistan citizens in a worse and long term war? especially about the women that deprived of it that are deprived of education as well as uh, as well what is your suggestion regarding the women who are left helpless in pakistan turkey iran etc um and i guess that's kind of really really important and i also wanted to read out another comment um Again, not sure whether the comment is from uh, Palwasha. I'm not sure whether you would like me to read it out or whether you would like to read it out yourself. OK, I, I think you touched on this, Kerry, but I think it's, it's important to read it out. Um, so I don't see this aspect of qualm a solidarity for a refugee from my own experience lived as a stateless child during the 90s in Peshawar with no basic right health and education benefits now as a sociologist looking back to that life looked not privileged or solidarity um and, and i guess i just wanted to kind of open the discussion on this um and then louise uh, I'll, I'll come back to you Um, hello. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can, Pulwasha. Yeah, the uh, calm aspect, it's uh, very generally used and uh, very familiar to that. And uh, I believe from my own perspective that it's not a positive aspect. Like, uh, for example, uh, due to this uh, aspect, uh, like there were many uh, influence from from that side to Afghan politics and right now there is no influence because there is no need to it uh, like uh, and uh, uh, and also when there are refugees uh, it's not like uh, from my own experience it wasn't that privileged it wasn't that good as it is said like uh, people say what they don't mean or people mean what they don't say so it's very difficult while doing the qualitative research like what affects uh, or what influence uh, those research and the environment those research are done is uh, also very important. Like sometimes, for example, uh, currently when the Taliban came, like uh, at first they were kind of like the gunmen, they were standing behind the journalists and they were just sweating and <laughs> afraid and saying what they what the Taliban were trying to do. So, so that kind of influence or uh, thing that uh, make people to say what uh, they are supposed to say. So the so research done in the context uh, should be understood. Like uh, if the refugees they are in a very um, 
a vulnerable situation and uh, they might say uh, things that uh, they think is needed to say. So in my view, like uh, this calm perspective is very um, simplified and uh, there is no solidarity to that. So because we don't have one calm in Afghanistan, we have diversity. And uh, when this uh, this aspect is explained from a very simplified uh, version, it uh, just uh, neglects the diversity of ethnicities and uh, languages and all in Afghanistan and the overall like thousands of years of history of Afghanistan. Like there are not only Pashtuns in Afghanistan for uh, just to say it clearly, there are many other ethnicities that should be uh, confirmed and there are many other ethnicities that have migrated to Iran and Afghanistan, like not only the Pashtuns. So uh, it says like, OK, the Pashtuns are majority that are migrated in Afghanistan and they are just uh, like very privileged. And they, uh, uh, that's not the case from my experience as I uh, lived there for 16 years when I came to Afghanistan uh, while doing my high school. So yeah, that was uh, it, it's very simplified. That's what I would say very simply, because if I go to the details, it will be just a very long discussion. Thank you very much, Paul Washa. I'm mindful of the time and we actually have six minutes left. And um, I was wondering if anyone wanted to comment on Farzana's uh, comment. I mean, um, may, maybe I can say something, although I know Louise has her hand up. Uh, look, um, it's a very unfortunate situation. It's a tragedy. And in, in fact, in, the, in, the, in my presentation, I was talking about the inter diasporic dynamics. It is this kind of trauma that is now haunting uh, a lot of the newly arrived and actually not the, so many of the new, but also those were established diasporic individuals in the West uh, who've seen the collapse of Afghanistan uh, you know, in front of them, it's, it's pretty traumatic. Uh, unfortunately, the reality is that including the British government, uh, which uh, was, you know, which continues to engage with the Taliban, uh, the European Union has a mission in Kabul. It's the only Western entity that actually maintains a diplomatic presence, although it says it doesn't recognize uh, the Taliban regime. There is engagement with the Taliban and there is a sort of a normalization of the Taliban that is happening. Uh, the, the difficulty is obviously that politics is driven by interest and the interest in Afghanistan for, for decades in the Western sense is seen through the lens of security. And if the Taliban are seen as partners in counterterrorism and security and things like that, unfortunately, we just have to keep advocating for these uh, poor people, these poor souls, you know, are oppressed in Afghanistan. But I don't necessarily see, unfortunately, in the short term, a change of course uh, from the Western or regional countries. And uh, I don't see the Taliban changing as a result either. So there is unfortunately, unfortunately, there's very little leverage against the Taliban. Um, and, and, and it's a very sad situation, but we got to have to keep. I mean, the best thing we can do really as a collective is to try and make sure that Afghanistan is not forgotten. And I think that's like the bare minimum that it should be done at this precise moment. But I, I mean, don't. don't Pause you there, because I think this is a great way to end, you know, and I guess conversations like this are really, really important to make sure that we don't forget. Um, Louise, I wanted to come back to you before we end. Yes, yeah, so I'll just wrap up um, because I'm very conscious of time and thank you so much, Angie, for sharing. I, it's clear that you, you have a, a knowledge of the topic yourself and you made some brilliant links between the papers. I just wanted to raise the point again for Jana, who's working with us on our project and we're very pleased that Farjana has joined our research team here at London Metropolitan University working with Maria, myself and our other colleague Alessia. And it, it is about the trauma as Hamid was also mentioning and that's why our research is longitudinal and what we are doing is following up with our participants, many of whom were evacuees, they were in the hotels and when they were in the hotels uh, their primary kind of obsession was to get out of the hotels as quickly as possible. Many of them were there for 18 months. Now they are getting out of the hotels. They have to because the government is no longer funding the hotels and will close them down. And so they are moving into the private rented sector. Some of them are in housing associations. And this is when the kind of the trauma now is really starting to hit because they're struggling. They're, and, and it is about not forgetting. 
it's about not assuming that because people were rescued, I'm putting that in inverted commas for those who can't see me, by the wonderful British government rescuing people from Kabul airport, that somehow everything is okay when actually people need that ongoing support for years to come. And that's so important. And that's part of what we're trying to do in our research. But I just wanted to take that moment to thank everybody. I think it's been a wonderful session. It feels like we can't stop. We were wondering, will we have enough to talk about for two hours? But clearly two hours is not enough. And hopefully we'll be able to have further events and further conversations about such an important topic. And I'm really pleased that all the speakers were able to come and present such complementary perspectives. Um, so thank you all very much. And as Angie has said, the recording will be available on the Global Diversities and Inequalities Research Centre website. So please do check out the website as well for our uh, forthcoming events. So thank you all very much. And thank you to you too, Angie. Thank you very much. Bye, everybody. Bye bye. I think I need to turn off the recording now or it'll record three minutes of everybody saying goodbye.